Last year, carpet fitter Dave Phillips experienced the most exhilarating day of his life. While out metal detecting, he discovered a spectacular hoard of Roman treasure. Believe me, I mean, I do carpet fitting, I've got bad joints. I didn't have bad joints on that day. Dave's discovery was the beginning of an incredible journey that would enable us to piece together the lavish life and death of Roman Britain's richest couple. It's something I've longed for to find something fantastic, and it looks like I've done it this time. And now I've done it, I want to do it again and again and again and again. Treasure. It's all around us. Look at that. Every day, new finds are bringing our history to life. I think we've got a find over here. I'm Miranda Kristovnikov. Join me in this hidden world where passions run high, where secrets are kept, and where serious money can be made. The world of hidden treasure. I'm in deepest Hertfordshire on my way to meet Dave Phillips, who made this sensational find. 78, 80. Hi there. Hi, Dave. I'm Miranda. Pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. Come on, Jane. Yes. Yeah, that's my new little doggy. Oh, Just got her from the rescue centre. Yeah, this is Carol, my lovely lady. Hi, Carol, nice to meet you. you. Yeah. Hi. How did you guys get into metal detecting? Well, he was driving me crazy one day. He was sitting here one Saturday afternoon, coming and hourly because he didn't have anything to do. He gets bored very easily. And we bought him a detector there and then, that afternoon. And that changed everything, didn't it? It changed really? everything. Yeah. It really did, yes. So it just took my life over. I just absolutely love it. And so it's not, not boring it? anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> not bored anymore. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dave had been searching for 11 years before he hit on his discovery of a lifetime. Went out metal detecting with my mate Colin. All of a sudden, I got a little tiny whisper. So I took six inches of soil away. Beep, beep. And it got louder and louder and louder and louder. And we found this monster great lump of metal. Straight away, I screamed and called it, yeah, we've got gold. I mean, it was huge. And we dug and we dug and we dug it. And we've got glass bottles. And now we've got these fabulous silver brooches, a silver chain, sword blade. And we're going balmy now. We're going, Ugh. What did you think you'd unearthed? <laughs> I don't know, really. I said, God, Alad- Aladdin's cave. I, I don't know, it was like t- Tutankhamun. Dave knew he had a legal responsibility to report his discovery within 14 days. Under the Treasure Act, he could also be eligible for a big reward. Bursting with excitement, he rushed his finds into Verilamium Museum in St Albans, where staff quickly realised he'd unearthed an extremely important site from Roman Britain. Chief archaeologist Simon West took charge of the case. Flabbergasted would be a, a good term. And really it was a worry too, because these finds were... had. David picked the finds out of the ground, but there were others there, so there's the potential for people to come and actually raid the site and steal the objects. And that night, just very difficult to actually sleep. By the following morning, Simon had organised an emergency excavation at the find spot. As the team dug down through more treasure, they hit upon a grisly discovery. Tiny fragments of burnt human bone. It became clear that this was more than just a hoard. They were now dealing with the graves of two fabulously rich individuals, buried with their most precious possessions. It was time to launch our investigation into Dave's breathtaking find. First, I set off to the museum to meet Simon and see the collection for myself. Well, these are the finds that David and um, ourselves have dug up. It's no wonder he's so excited about it all <laughs> such a huge amount of stuff here, I can't believe it. Let me take you through some of these. Go on, We've got, Go the, on. got the urn from the second burial, and we have the, the casket possibly from the first group. Brilliant. We've got glass jugs, and of course yeah. probably the most photogenic. Of yes. Those two, one from each burial. It's like a, it was like a real treasure trove, isn't it? It is. The graves held more than 150 objects gathered from the four corners of the Roman Empire. Bronze vessels from Pompeii, Glass from Germany, pottery from France, and a pair of exquisite silver brooches from Britain. 
But who were these fabulously rich Romans buried with this amazing hoard? And why was their final resting place a field in the middle of the English countryside? One clue to their identity lies in the fact that they were buried only eight miles from Roman Britain's third largest city, Verulamium, known today as St Albans. 2,000 years ago, this was a thriving metropolis, complete with markets, temples and public baths. The remains of the magnificent theatre are still standing today. So what exactly would have happened here? Well, this is a stage where you'd have plays, possibly festivals, maybe even bear-baiting, gladiatorial games. Seriously, here? Seriously, in the arena. Yeah. And that's a word for sand, where the blood would have been absorbed. Oh, nasty. It's tantalising to think that there is a link between this magnificent Roman city and our burial site just eight miles away. It was there I met up with Dave and Simon. They promised to bring me up to date with what had been found on the site so far using a 3D model. What we have are the two burials, the main burial and the second burial. And of course we had the nice finds out of those. Then we did some geophysics and decided to open it all up. And this is the emergency excavation. Right, and what did you find? What we had are the two burials and the surrounding that are other features. We had these round ones, which are probably round buildings, late Iron Age. And what happened over here? Well, this was the, the other trench we excavated. We've got a T-shaped join of two walls. But what is it? We just don't know, and it's so close to the burials, there must be some link. To find out if the wall and the graves are linked, we've got to dig. One trench will be put in over the curved features, but first the excavation team will attack the area around the T-shaped wall. Within minutes of removing the topsoil, Simon makes an exciting discovery. We've just found two chalk walls on the same alignment as the original wall, but they have a different construction. Do you know what the building might be? Well, it could be almost anything from a, a temple mausolea to a villa, maybe a barn. That's assuming it's Roman. It could even be an Anglo-Saxon one, potentially, no, or medieval. <laughs> no, I don't want it. I want it to be Roman. So you've got to do more digging around these walls, have you, to we, work out what it is? We've got to open up, really, most of the building, if not all of it, to understand its plan. Once we can understand its plan, we can assign the function, and therefore we will know the building. Could you take it back at that level for me? As the excavation team ploughed on, pulling back more and more soil, it looked like we were uncovering a substantial structure. And with our graves only 50 metres away, could there be a connection to the building? I asked Simon to show me the pits where David found the treasure. This is the rectangular hole, which was the main burial. So you can imagine all the pots, the bronzes, the whole lot in, in that hole. Wow. And where's the second burial? This is the second burial, exactly seven metres apart. Much shallower, much smaller. Much smaller. This again had the smaller jug in, but more samey and more glass. Before being placed in the graves with their treasured possessions, the bodies had been cremated. Cremation was common in Roman times. For the rich, it would have been an extravagant affair with a huge procession of family, dignitaries and even hired mourners. As the body burned on the pyre, priests carried out bizarre rituals and animal sacrifice. But why did the Romans cremate their dead? To find out, I sent Dave to Salisbury with the fragments of bone collected from the graves. He's going to meet cremation expert Jackie McKinley. The ideas behind cremating are things like freeing the spirit from the body because you've, you're destroying the body, so you're freeing the spirit. Fire is also a purifier. Mm. It purifies and it transforms. It's a transformation process from one thing to another visually mm. that you can see straight away. When the embers had cooled, the remaining pieces of burnt bone were collected to place in the grave. 
But with so little left of the bodies, it looked unlikely that we would learn much about our two individuals from their remains. Although there were a few clues. Now I can tell that it's an adult over the age of about 30 because I've got a piece of clavicle, which is the collarbone, mm. and it's fused and that happens around sort of 29 to 30 years. We can sex it on the basis of certainly a number of the skull traits. Mm -hmm. This piece here, this is actually a piece of the supraorbital margin. It's this little bit of bone oh. here. Now this is a male skull. And if you can see the difference here, can you see how this is actually a very sharp margin, mm -hmm. whereas in the males it tends to be more rounded. So that suggests it's female. And then we look at this one here. So little was left of the second body that Jackie could only tell us that it was an adult, possibly female or a lightly built male. But there was still nothing to tell us why our couple were buried eight miles outside the majestic city of Verulamium. Until, that is, I got back onto site and saw what the excavation team had unearthed. Before was this T-shape of two walls. Yeah. And that was in the original trench. Now that's become a suite of rooms down one side of the building. Beautiful. So what's over here? We now have a corridor running down, right down here, from the top end of the trench, down this wall, into this end. Fantastic. We'd discovered a huge building, 30 metres long and 20 metres wide, divided into several rooms. Do you know what it might be? Well, it has the sort of form of an early type of villa where you get a corridor and then you get the suite of rooms off to one side. God, that's pretty. So we might have a villa here? We may have a villa here. Dave's partner, Carol, is one of the team excavating our fantastic new building. His big discovery inspired her to train as a field archaeologist. Dave, however, prefers to stick to metal detecting, and his luck continues when he locates an object deep underground. Hey, Simon, cracking signal, mate. What have you got? I don't know, listen to that, though. It's like, is that a good one? <laughs> yeah? Well, that is in old ground, that's never been disturbed. Fantastic, can we dig it out? What I'll do is I'll mark it so that when we actually get to this context and actually take the object out, then we'll understand precisely where it's coming from. And that will give us much more information than just an object by itself. Oh, so we have to wait then, basically. We have to wait on this one. Damn. Really? That's really frustrating, though. I mean, he's got a signal there. We want to get well, it out and have a look. You grab him, I'll dig. <laughs> <laughs> the urge to dig out the hotspot is unbearable. But Simon's right. We need to be patient or we could destroy vital archaeological evidence. Yeah. To keep Dave's mind off digging up the hotspot, I sent him to Oxford. His mission? To see if the objects buried in the graves could reveal anything else about their owners. <laughs> Professor Martin Hennig is an expert in Roman art. This is just one of the items, but I'll let you... Uh, all right. This is absolutely amazing. This is one of the finest... Roman vessels I, I have ever seen. It's very, very beautifully made. The person who owned this must be absolutely top-notch. Somebody mm. who could yeah. afford the very, very best that you could money could possibly buy. Yeah. Today it's green because of the patina that it takes on, but in its day it would look like gold, wouldn't it? Because yeah. the bronze is that Absolutely form. right. I mean, they would certainly have been extremely swanky things to have on your dinner table. And, you know, I wonder what this jug had seen in the course of its lifetime. I wonder, you know, how that little dent occurred. Yeah, and, I, and one suspect that this got dropped after a particularly riotous dinner party. <laughs> it looks like our grave owners certainly enjoyed all the benefits that came with an upper-class lifestyle. But why take such expensive items with you to the grave? The Romans believed that after death, a ferryman sailed you across the sea into the afterlife. The objects were placed in the grave to help you on your journey. Who do you think that is? Is that Beckers? No, this is a triton. This is a sea mm -hmm. creature. I think this brings in, with a burial, of course, the, the idea of the voyage of the soul over the sea to the other world. I actually did find uh, a coin in that one. That was presumably for the ferryman. <laughs> so they say. We found a coin, we've got the objects, 
Did he ever get to the next world? Uh, oh, I hope he did. And I, ho- <laughs> I, I hope he's still there enjoying himself. And I, I would really love to meet him. The hoard of 150 cherished possessions was crammed into the graves so a rich couple could keep living the high life after death. But then some even more startling news. It seems their send-off was more sumptuous than I could have ever imagined. Wow, look at this. That's fantastic. What is this? Scientist Pat Wiltshire has discovered that our graves had been filled with a lavish feast. sort of foods that you think were inside these containers and flasks actually during the burial? No, I know they were there because I've got remains of them there. Even though the food has rotted away, Pat has found microscopic pollen grains clinging to the insides of the vessels. That particular one is the lentil. So how do we know it's a lentil? Well, for one thing, it's got three furrows going from the pole of the grain to the south pole to the north pole, if you like. So that's lentil. What about this one here? That's the walnut. And you can see it's got these little pustules on it. It's like it's got spots. So we've got lentil, we've got walnut. What other foodstuffs did you find? Come to the table and I'll show you. Perhaps the best. Oh, glass of wine. Wine. Marvellous. We have wheat there. Now, that looks like porridge, but they could have possibly made bread, of course. There we have grapes. Well, of course, we've got the wine, so Mm. we've certainly had grape pollen. What are those? Well, they look awful, don't they? But they're delicious. I think so. They are pickled walnuts. And we have these lovely olives. I was going to say, it looks quite Mediterranean, really. Oh, yes. I mean, OK, they could have had a vineyard here and they could have grown bread. But olives? Mm. I don't think so. Lentils? No. So these are probably, these are imported. And yes, this is high status. Very special people would have eaten food like this. It seems our rich couple were determined to enjoy themselves in life and death, embracing all the exotic perks that came with life under Roman occupation. Back at the excavation, Simon's finally going to dig out Dave's hotspot. Come on, pull it out. Go on, Simon, get it out. Don't pull anything out. Oh, look. Hey, what is that? It's quite big. That's a fitting. Uh, what does a fitting mean, Simon? Well, yeah. it means anything we don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> so what sort of what would this have come from? You say a fitting. A fitting from what? A box, belt, horse harness. Oh, it, it looks like a fish. It's a dolphin. It? And they're not yeah, very good at drawing dolphins in Roman times. Well, were most they? of them would never have seen a dolphin. <laughs> well, they know what they look like. They've certainly got eyelashes. Little dolphin with eyelashes. Made of bronze, this exotic little creature is another reminder that this field must once have been a place of great significance. And in Trench 2, around the curved features, the excavation team are also uncovering further evidence of activity on the site. The curved features appear to be a cluster of pre-Roman roundhouses and a series of large post holes look like they would have supported a substantial building. We have excavated two... Three, four close together. Yeah. Bit of a gap. Is that significant at all? It may be significant if you've got an entrance where you'd want a place for a gate or a bar. So if it's a building, what sort of building would it be? Maybe a sort of a hall, maybe a Roman barn. Fantastic. And what about the curved feature here? Have we found any more of that? We have if you've got an eye of faith. <laughs> Go on, walk we me through. cleaned up yet. You can just about see a slightly greyer brown stain coming round. I don't see here. anything there. I have faith. If Simon is to be believed, there are at least 11 structures scattered across the site, forming what seems to be a vast country estate. Carol, how's it going? Hi. Carol's busy excavating one of the buildings. So what do you get out of doing this? You can see where these people were and what they were doing. And you can actually see the shapes of the buildings and where they were working. It's great. No, it's really good. Good for the imagination. You can start making up stories about them. But what was the story of our couple? Why were they buried out here in the countryside? Simon has called Dave into the museum with a possible answer. During the emergency excavation, a dull lump of earth was recovered from one of the graves. After hours of painstaking investigation, this unpromising find has undergone an astonishing transformation. Remember when we excavated that rusty red lump of soil? 
Mm. And we've actually got an X-ray of it. Can you see what's in there? Because at first I couldn't. And it's actually become this group of... What, that? That is that? Is that group of arrowheads. You have no laugh, have you? We also have the three knives which you took out the grave. Now think it's actually a hunter's kit. Is that a commonplace thing in Britain? As far as I know, a hunting kit in a grave is unique. It seems our grave owners loved hunting the game that once teemed around Verulamium. Their kit contained over 30 arrowheads, different shapes for killing different types of animal, many of which are extinct in Britain today. Imagine if you're out and you suddenly come across something like a bear or a boar. What you'd probably use is something like this arrow. It'd be like an armour-piercing arrow. And then for sort of animals like wolves, you'd use a sort of a barb-shaped one which is designed to hit an organ or cut a vein or an artery. It's really about the activity that the person was taking in their life and went into their afterlife with. So it's obviously a favourite activity. It points to the person actually in the grave, what they liked, what they did. Hunting, feasting and drinking were clearly central to their aristocratic lifestyle. Finally, it was clear exactly how privileged our rich couple had been. But what's their connection to the vast country estate we're unearthing? A week later, Simon called me back to the site with an exciting possibility. Simon, you're in business. You must be thrilled. Yes, I'm really thrilled. The excavation team have confirmed that we really do have a magnificent Roman villa on our estate. If we go out what I think is the front of the building. So here's your entrance here's here. The entrance. Great. We'll Through in. into a long corridor. Yep. And then you've got, op- well, directly opposite you is a large room. I like to think that was either the dining room or sort of the sitting room. Quite, yeah. a, quite a sumptuous place. Yeah. And then down this side, you've got a really narrow room. So what would that have been? I'd like to think it's actually a staircase. So I mean, we've got more than one storey? We've here. got two, sto- sto- yeah. two storeys built in wood going all the way up. So would you have had bedrooms upstairs? Bedrooms above, or maybe even the more private rooms as well. The villa is one of the finest discovered in the last 50 years. With at least 20 rooms and eight bedrooms, there was space for a large family and their servants. It had kitchens, a grand hall for entertaining and a luxury interior. Nowadays, people think of brick and stone building as being the top quality, whereas there's no reason why you couldn't have a timber structure which could be whitewashed, it could be even gilded on the inside. Imagine lots of carvings, beautiful staircases going up. Really sumptuous, top quality. You could have panelling, almost anything you wanted. And these people were rich to have a villa like this. So, could the couple from our graves have been the wealthy owners of this villa? If they were, it would mean that they were buried in the grounds of their palatial estate. A fantastic end to our story. We know from its architectural plan that the villa was occupied between 75 and 150 AD. The problem is, we don't know when our couple lived or died. Our last chance of dating the graves is in Carol's hands. She's off to Leeds to meet Brenda Dickinson, who's an expert in Roman pottery. Hello, hello, Brenda. I'll take those promises for you, look. Thank you. I've been waiting for these with bated breath. Roman potters marked their goods with a maker's stamp. Brenda has built up the largest catalogue of stamps in the world, and from these she can date almost any pot. But only if the stamp is readable. Ah, mm, oh dear. It's uh, rather badly abraded in the middle, so the stamp isn't all that clear. I think it's probably too far gone. It's looking unlikely that Brenda will be able to pinpoint a date. Cups without stamps, that's unusual. No, that's eroded again. Then, just as we were giving up hope... Oh, oh, this is Kinemus. This is the big boy. The uh, the main, the biggest potting name. Right. At La Zoo in, in central France. In central France? Yeah. And when was he operating? Most of his output was 
probably in the second half of the second century. So the latest it would be is around about 150? Around about 150, perhaps stretch it to 155. Fantastic! We've got a match. The pottery in the graves tells us that our couple lived at the same time the villa was occupied. It looks like they lived in this magnificent house and, after a life of luxury, were buried in the imposing setting of their country estate. We took our findings to expert J.D. Hill at the British Museum. J.D., we know that these burials are very rich, but just how rich were these people? These are the sorts of people who are you know, essentially ruling St Albans. And given that St Albans, Verulamium in that time, was one of the largest cities in Roman Britain, these are the sorts of people who are you know, the wheelers and dealers across the whole of the province. And do we know what was going on in their lifetime? The theatre, that's being built perhaps in, what, the 130s, 140s. So these people are exa- alive at exactly the time. This fantastic civic monuments going up. This is a person you would expect to see sitting in that theatre, watching gladiatorial games, watching plays, watching all sorts of civic ceremonies and rituals and activities taking place. Can we speculate on who these people were? This is the, you know, the really upper class of Roman Britain, the upper class of the Roman Empire. These, these are the people who rule Britain. can you put a price on the fabulous funeral hoard of a ruler of Britain? Because Dave's find contains silver in the form of two tiny brooches, under the Treasure Act he's entitled to a reward for the entire hoard. Hidden Treasure has been given exclusive access to the government-appointed Treasure Valuation Committee, who are responsible for placing a value on the find. They need to arrive at a figure that reflects its current commercial value. There is always a perception that um, an item could be worth more. Everybody likes to feel that about anything they have a financial interest in. The committee's decision could transform Dave's life. It's it's a wonderful hobby, but you've still got to work for a little bit. Unless, of course, I want to put a big value on it. We have to take into into account the considerable cost of conservation because it is a very expensive process to conserve a group like that. It'd be nice if it would give me enough money to pack this up. It's killing me, you know. After two hours, they reach a decision. I think we've arrived at a fair value, yes. We all agree? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Good. I collected the valuation and headed back to Dave at the dig site. That's what I've got here. Oh. But this feels like uh, Uh, opening your exam results. (laughs) I hope it's going to be better than my (laughs) exam results. Before you open it, what do you think it's going to be? Whatever it is, it's cream on the cake, really. You can't replace what we've been given. Excitement. But I'm going to have a look because I need to know. (laughs) Put me out of my misery. 31,000. 31,000? Yeah. 31,000, is that what you expected? That's not bad, is it, for swinging a metal detector (laughs) and getting the thrill of a lifetime? After the thrill of success, Dave's back out in the field, searching and hoping for his next magical discovery. Who knows what lies beneath his feet? Next time on Hidden Treasure, the chance discovery of a gold sword handle takes us on a journey exploring England's Dark Ages, Saxon treasure from Sutton Hoo and Viking kingdoms. 